Thank you so much for joining us today. In this discussion, we are talking about the future of technology jobs. And the most important part of it is what we are going through now, which is what does this mean in terms of change in the skilling process? Thankfully, we have with us three people who have been living this journey. So welcome to this, Dr. Paul, Mr. Ayur Kaul, and Professor Rudra Pratap, who represent Talent Sprint, Skillshare, and Plaksha University. And each of them have been in different ways preparing students and professionals for skilling for new technology jobs. So it's going to be very interesting learning from them. So welcome again to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll start with you, Dr. Paul. So, you know, when we have spoken about this topic and you've given a very clear framework where, where you talked about three kinds of possible collaboration between machines and algorithms and humans in the future. So if I remember correctly, you talked about algorithm creators who are the ones who will build algorithms of the future on which the work would might be running. You spoke about algorithm collaborators, which is an interesting and emerging segment where this could be across domains. More people might be working with the algos and the machines. And then you talked about algorithm workers who might be working by the algorithm. So if you could just take that framework, Dr. Paul, and paint us a picture of how you imagine that world with a few examples. Sure, thank you so much, Devlina. It's great to be here with uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, lovely to meet all of you. Yeah, I think Devlina was referring back to a conversation that we had some time ago where, um, you know, in an attempt to discover and predict the future of the workforce uh, in, a, in the light of machine learning and AI being a dominant theme, uh, the question was that what happens to the workforce in the future? And, and the realization we came to was that um, there are going to be people who are going to be highly valued the top of the so-called uh, professional food chain who are going to be the people who are writing the algorithms of the future. So if you are, for example, somebody who writes the app for the next Uber and the algorithm for the next Uber, clearly that's a very aspirational category, an entrepreneur, uh, perhaps somebody who can go out and conquer the world in terms of a new technology breakthrough or a disruption. So clearly at the apex of the pyramid, we have potentially the algorithm writers, people who create the next generation of great product services using technology. And this doesn't have to be purely tech tech alone. It can be in any industry, whether it's in manufacturing, it can be in aviation, it can be in healthcare, in every area because of digital disruptions, it's possible to be a great algorithm creator. And, and I, we believe that such people are going to be at the top of the food chain. So for example, I gave the example of Uber, but imagine if you are the person who invents the mechanism for the smart factory of the future, where all automation that happens in a factory leads to an extremely efficient model of manufacturing, which is far more productive or you know how to create a nuclear power plant which does not require humans, can be run by algorithms. So therefore, uh, creators of algorithms are great value. The question then comes, what happens? Because algorithm creators cannot be more than perhaps 1% of the workforce. Uh, the majority cannot be at the top of the pyramid by definition of the structure of the pyramid itself. So what happens at the next level? So perhaps another 10, 20, 30% of the workforce of the future can be extremely skilled professionals. In fact, the word professional itself gives an indication of this because historically people who are professionals can be lawyers, engineers, doctors, accountants, et cetera. And we call them the professions for a reason because they have a uh, established practice and process of getting things done in sophisticated areas where knowledge work is important. So imagine, for example, in this world of algorithm, create, uh, algorithm collaborators, um, the, the commander of a flight who flies an extremely sophisticated uh, you know, commercial airliner. So perhaps somebody who flies the next Airbus 380 or beyond is essentially somebody who's highly skilled in using the machines because the machines will fly themselves largely 95 to 98% of the time, the aircraft flies itself. But you need a very sophisticated supervisor who essentially works with that machine to make sure all this is going well and steps in if there are exceptions or steps in if there is a requirement to change things. Or imagine a robotic surgeon who is going to use a robotic platform like Da Vinci to conduct a very sophisticated, extremely efficient uh, surgical operation, which leads to practically no blood loss and no morbidity and people go back to work the next day, et cetera. So another example of a medical professional who can be an algorithm collaborator. 
and so on and so on. I can give you many, many examples where humans are working tightly with machines to create a very high quality outcome where both the machine and the human are in a very friendly symbiotic loop, which is creating a great outcome, right? So that's the next level of professionals who also will be very successful, wealthy in the future as well. The category that's remaining after that, perhaps 60, 70% of the workforce, which is of course a great worry to all of us uh, is because the world's population is increasing and these are people who are, we see them today, delivering food for Zomato or delivering your package from Amazon or driving a Uber car. These are examples of people who are working for the algorithm. Essentially, they take the algorithm as their boss. They are perhaps part of the gig economy and they go out there and essentially carry out instruction the algorithm with very little, if any, leeway in terms of how they can exercise their own uh, autonomy. There's hardly any. They have to follow the algorithm to the last letter. So those are three, you know, sort of uh, think of it that as a three-level framework of algorithm creators, collaborators, and those who work for the algorithm as uh, the workforce of the future. Right. No, thank you so much, Dr. Paul. And um, in fact, in our report, we have explained this in detail with the philosophy and the framework which Dr. Paul has mentioned right now. Let me turn to you now, uh, Professor Pratap. Um, so, you know, and we were discussing the curriculum which you have developed in Plaksha and the reason, you know, behind that being that you feel that the traditional curriculum when you're teaching engineering or software misses out some key real world components and two of the components which you have in your curriculum, I felt were really interesting and I wanted you to kind of, uh, you know, discuss that a little bit with this group and the people listening. Uh, these two are self-leadership and design. So if you can share Professor Pratap what difference is this making and connecting back to what Dr. Paul mentioned, is this helping more people move towards becoming collaborators, if not creators? Um, absolutely. Thank you, <clears throat> Devlina, for having me here. And uh, uh, in the distinguished uh, panel of panelists uh, like Santanu and Ayur, <clears throat> uh, Yes, we do have uh, these distinctive features and these features have come after a lot of deliberations with educationists all across the world. This is not something that we only dreamt of, but uh, education per se is also going through a huge churn that what should the future universities look like or what should the future of education be like? So in that context, it always comes up that uh, you know, what we think of engineers, are we really creating, um, you know, uh, complete engineers, in a sense, if you will. So what does complete engineers mean? And uh, if you listen to industry, industry has certain viewpoint uh, that, you know, engineers must also have communication skills, they must also know how to work in teams. Uh, what fresh graduates look like is that they have, they have certain skill set and that's about it you know that this it's a technical skill set uh, they know certain things how to write programs or whatever but uh, you know when you think about engineers of tomorrow you are looking at people who will look at society as you know society is their their uh, clientele right they are solving problems of society who understands society so through design curriculum, we bring that aspect in. In design, it's not about just functional design. Functional design, all engineers know, you know, uh, how to make something do what function it is supposed to do. That's not it. Today's design space is much bigger. There is sustainability, which is at the core of it. What does sustainability of, uh, of a particular design mean? You know, where are these whatever it is that you are creating, where is it going to go at the end? How much energy is being used for this? Is that, is that something that we can afford as a society for creating billions of pieces of such a thing? So, you know, there are different angles of design. It's not merely functional design or even for that matter, ergonomic design, which, is, which has been around for a while also. But, looking at design from social perspective, looking at design from uh, this planet Earth sustain sustainability perspective. So those elements today are very, very vital. And self and leadership is for discovering that, hey, you are, you are not a peg in this whole chain. You are a thinking human being. 
you you've got to question things and you've got to be able to lead a team of people who have who are coming with uh, sort of conflicting uh, you know uh, requirements to a design how do you lead that team to convert on on something which is at the end really good for the company you work for or uh, and the planet that you work for these are very very broad sort of uh, uh, parameters on which you want to train them right that how do you identify these things how do you uh, work towards this self you know self and leadership so self discovery is also part of this whole journey you know there was a generation you know in my generation there was no self discovery you 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 got the branch you got uh, you took the job that came along and it was not necessarily driven by the passion you had but today we have that luxury you know you just heard you know lots of things we can you know relegate to uh, ai you know let ai do this let machine learning do lots of chores but you want to discover what is your passion what what drives you and that is not automatic as as we think you know there are there are methods to do this there are systematic ways of uh, engaging students into this craft and that's what we are trying to do so apart from skills in uh, algorithmic thinking or computational thinking or you know discovering new algorithms apart from all of that learn you know teaching them ml ai all those techniques which are technical this part is very very vital for producing technical leaders of tomorrow which is what our mandate is at plaksha great no thank you thank you professor pratap and i'll come to you now mr call and you know uh, shantanu uh, paul gave us a, a framework a three step framework if you can call it dr pratap and professor pratap mentioned um, you know different aspects of skills which should come under an engineering curriculum to really prepare um, you know wholesome engineering uh, professionals and when you come to skill share apart from technology and business you actually have courses on creative uh, skills and also lifestyle right which could include culinary crafts etc so do you see a very different profile of learners across these categories or do you see a connected thread like people are choosing to self learn even across these categories including technology and business skills Thank you so much, uh, Dablina. First of all, for having me here, and it's great to be, uh, you know, sharing a screen with the uh, esteemed people like Dr. Shantanu and uh, Mr. Rudra Pratap. Uh, to your question, uh, we believe that Skillshare is, you know, for uh, for someone who's just who's creative and curious, and uh, that spreads across uh, whether whether it's uh, whether he has a tech background or doesn't have a tech background, whether they are looking for something in tech, business, or like just for lifelong uh, life learning skills. so uh, what we see is that uh, a same person can be a data scientist or a decision scientist in a day or like a full stack developer but still have a flair for writing photography uh, learning culinary skills or learning something uh, on on the lines of illustration and design because that's that's something that that moves uh, moves that person uh, what i what i mean to say is that uh, millennials and gen z uh, they are they are they're going to have varied interest areas uh, they have uh, they are uh, they don't shy away from taking risk uh, their attention span is less so they want to try different different things they don't want to they, they live in the fear of missing out so uh, it's it's not either this or that it is this and that so uh, to your to your question i would say that we do not see like a clear distinguish uh, uh, like a pattern between people who are do, who are taking who are taking tech classes and product uh, productivity classes and uh, someone who's completely different who's taking a say say culinary class but it's it's the same set of people once you once with the 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 core pillar for us is that you have to have that curiosity and creativity in uh, in your dna and if that is there then uh, the domain doesn't matter right right no thank you so much in a way we are saying that by doing this um polymath skills are being uh, you know kind of encouraged um, among professionals even engineering uh, graduates and more and more people could then probably look at their skills a little broadly than a or b right it's a combination yes. of a plus b is what you're saying and that might uh, you know kind of help them become better problem solvers so dr paul coming back to you i think one thing which you had mentioned to me when we had spoken you know regarding the report as well was that you know you look at 
the curriculum as something which really helps people become problem solvers right that's the number one goal and how do you therefore do that through different kind of comput computational problem solving uh, you know methods during the curriculum so in your journey as well um, you know through talent sprint and now with nse initially you were focusing on data science and technology and now there is you know focus of a combination of that along with financial services so is this again you know a turn towards the more computational domain specific problem solving skills which the world would need and therefore you know professionals training for that world of future tech jobs would need or is there any other way to decode this well i guess uh, there's a multiple questions packed into that but let me just start by addressing your i think initial point that the whole purpose of uh, learning and advanced learning the kind that we're talking about uh, and of course i completely also agree with everything i used said apart from what dr pratap said that you know problem solving is the heart of essentially good education right i mean end of the day if you don't exit as problem solvers then i don't know what the purpose of learning is right you should be able to marshal all the skills and talents we learn and that we have god gifted plus what we learn from our teachers and environments to put it to good practice and problem solving so i think to me the whole uh, essential idea here is that you know i think one of the things that i've been thinking about a lot lately is that the nature of education and i think uh, dr pratap mentioned this quite well and i just want to add to that little bit to say that you know the whole purpose of education is to essentially treat students and college as emerging professionals not to treat them as students but treat them as emerging professionals from the very first moment they join college which means that you know in a professional world for example we expect professionals to self learn we don't expect them to be given you know 10 lectures a week or five lectures a day we want them to be self learn a self motivated learners who can go out and they have the tools to acquire learning that they need on demand right that's a important skill the other skill which you also mentioned was this idea of working in teams i think peer learning is a great uh, aspect of learning i mean look back to our own college days how much do you remember the professors how much do you remember our friends our classmates and how much do we learn from our classmates perhaps as much if not more and then we learn from specific professors so peer learning right and third and i want to quote one of my friends who's a professor at berkeley who says that the project is the new interview right if somebody has actually done something real that is interesting sophisticated and done that as part of their curriculum i think they are going to essentially in the that project is the ultimate showcase of your skills and any interview today worth the salt will give higher value to your project that you have done that is of substance than to anything that you can say about exams you've taken or grades you've got right so so in that sense the democratization is happening and i think the, the what i like about the direction that education is taking now and i think laksha is a great example of such an institution uh, is that we need to kind of create people who are you know what i call intellectual athletes right they have to be able to go out there and perform and to perform the rules of the game will emerge they don't know when they leave college what is the nature of that sport intellectual sport they will be asked to be part of so we are trying to build intellectual athletes who have the skill sets of self learning peer learning experiential learning by making things by building things by creating things so all that put together i think the direction of all of this and to your final question yes uh, why are we adding entire financial services curriculum because i think financial services like any other industry perhaps more than other industries the most tech disrupted industry in the world so wherever tech goes financial services are the first to pick it up and put it into practice so therefore convergence of tech and financial services is one reason why we are here and the other thing of course we didn't talk about this but if you look at the web 3.0 we talk about metaverse i think you see financial technology apart from ai Uh, and ar vr all three pillars of metaverse are all very interesting stuff of the future yes i think we will cover that as part of this entire uh, webinar uh, which we are doing at et but thank you so much for bringing that out uh, uh, dr dr paul and in fact i think as you mentioned in the interest of building intellectual athletes and um, you know if the project is really the interview and the learning so the question to you then professor pratap is where exactly is the role of the university you know there are different ways to learn right now a bright student a self learner a lifelong learner can find so many different ways in which they can accumulate their learning and the new education policy is also you know providing more flexible pathways right now so in this sense the university is also kind of going through its own learning process the corporates are also coming up with boot camps you know there are boot camp specific courses on technologies as well so um, how do you think the universities are reinventing themselves you know especially universities like universities like yours which are you know new age universities how are you kind of um, upskilling yourself for this change 
Um, yes, that's right. That universities have to learn too. And uh, what this new challenge has done is it has shaken universities quite a bit. Uh, you know, universities as they exist today, uh, you know, the, the older universities, they had founded on principles which are so old, right? We all know that. Uh, it, it's unbelievable. And it's very hard to make radical changes in such large systems. So that's why, you know, universities like Praksha are coming along because of this reason, that there is a, there is a void here. Uh, so the first thing a university has to do is be very, very nimble by design. You know, you have to keep reinventing and you have to put this in your design itself that uh, you can't have these departments that have existed forever and you can't close them, you know, it doesn't matter what you try to do. No, you know, departments should not exist, period, right? Um, but there is this huge urge of belonging that people want and that's why you know departments exist you know you you, you want that sense of membership uh, to something so how do you provide a new model for that you know that a university has to think of i love the uh, you know this phrase that uh, santanu used intellectual athletes you know so and i like the idea that it's athletes it's not one kind, it's not a runner. You know, you could, be, you could be training a sprinter, you could be also training a marathon runner. And you need both. You need all those guys in intellectual space too. So providing a university structure in which all of this is possible, which means that you are paying individual attention, individual training to students. Now that doesn't happen in the, in the kind of structure that exists right now in universities. But you can do that today, you know, the problem is with scaling. If I have to only teach 10 students or 100 students, I can do that. You know, uh, individual faculty members can pay individual attention. How do you scale? That's where, you know, these new age technologies like, you know, AI can help tremendously. So that these are the things that you are looking at, you know, bringing new age technologies into education and keeping it live wire that it, it, it is continuously changing. It's not like I set a syllabus today and that syllabus is going to now last for 10 years. Tough luck, it should change every semester. The third thing is that you have to make self learners. Now, you know, we are in a very dangerous territory today that everybody thinks that they can be self learners because, you know, there is WhatsApp university, there is Facebook university, there are, you know, all these sources of information but you know, you know it very well from personal experience and from experience of your friends. This information download, or you know, the avalanche rather of information, what does it do to us? Okay. You don't have that ability to see information correctly and get the right information. That's not a trivial task. So universities will be looking at imparting this kind of skill more and more. How do, you, how do you get all this information which is floating around, sieve it through something or create your own sieve so that what you get is actually a curated information that you can use effectively. This is going to be a part of university training. And also this fact that you are going to teach students how to learn something quickly on your own, right? Uh, also create like half a credit course, uh, one credit course, which should be for lifelong learning. You know, today Devlina wants to come and, you know, wants to know a part of AI. Plaksha should be able to handle that. That, okay, you know, you are coming with whatever background you are coming with, here you go. This is the, this is the one credit course. And at the end of it, you know, you know, whatever you wanted to know about AI or for quantum computing or whatever new technologies that come up, there is a need for such kind of education as well, right? So universities have to completely reinvent themselves, not a little bit. It's not about incremental changes anymore. Faculty have to be very, very different today. So I think that the challenge for universities is multifold and everybody, working in the university system 
all professors, thinking professors, they all know this fact, that this is what we are up against. The better, the, the faster we shape up, the better off we are. Right. In fact, you know, in this world of changed environment, you never really graduate from a university, right? It should be like That's a right. lifelong membership if you really Absolutely. have Absolutely. Yeah, lifelong learning. Absolutely. So let me take that thought and come to you, Mr. Call. So lifelong learning, you know, and in a way you enable that through Skillshare, but it's a very difficult uh, concept, right? I mean, most people naturally find it very tough to learn, you know, and to learn for an exam, to learn for a job itself is so hard. And then you're saying learn for life. It's so tough. So when you are enabling this through Skillshare, through your combination of courses, what do you think helps people to make that first call to action? Like today, I will learn this. If you can share, you know, some examples on that. And the second side is you have creators and you call them real world creators who have actually solved this and, you know, kind of been through that journey. Um, so give us a little bit of a little bit of understanding of the creator world as well, you know, as you call them. Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a great question because, you know, there is there's obviously a lot of drive required for someone to con keep continuously learning uh, uh, for, for, for the whole life. Uh, what uh, what I personally believe is like there are, there are two kinds of people. One, a small bucket who are very clear in their head early on that this is what they want to do. And, uh, you know, they are either privileged or they have the resources and they uh, do that uh, with all the support from their friends, family, the entire ecosystem, and they, uh, they achieve what they really set uh, themselves out to. But most of us are the ones who, as uh, you know, uh, Dr. Shantanu also said that they come into the system, they start, you know, um, absorbing things around them and then eventually they decide, okay, this is what I like. This is the aspect of a certain uh, uh, subject that I like and I want to, you know, go one level deeper in this. And this is how most of us find our niches in, uh, in the way when we, you know, when we grow up. And, what, what is happening with the Delta for this was like people used to, in, in a generation previous to me, they used to, you know, uh, find it when they are 35, 40. In my generation, they are at 28, 30. But now with the Gen Z, they are very clear with, with rapid experimentation and with things what they like at very early age of around 18 to 21. When they are in college, they're like, okay, yes, this is what I really want to do. This is what, you know, moves my needle. And this is what I, I want to spend more time uh, on. And that can also keep changing. You know, it's it's, it's not that they're committing to, uh, like, as you see, 20 years back, someone who used to join a company will be there for like next 30 years of life, will get a, will retire, get a nice favor in the same company for spending so much time. Today, people are like, okay, I tried this, did this for three years you know, maybe now it's time for me to try something new. They like new challenges and they want to, you know, explore different, uh, different, different uh, subjects for that matter. So it, it, it is difficult uh, for, uh, for, for, a, for, a, for a company like us to, you know, uh, what, how do you tap into these people uh, at, like, what, how do we know what is that they are currently learning? So that's why the, the one of the biggest uh, product bets that we have taken is that we do not sell a particular class or a course. What we say is that there is a Skillshare subscription that you come for and then you get access to 35, 40,000 classes. And you know, you can over a period of time because you have an yearly subscription, you go through all these classes, whatever you like. So today, maybe maybe it's photography that has got you here. You saw some uh, so, some ad on Facebook or Google and you thought that you know you want to learn photography at that point. So you enrolled on Skillshare, but eventually you thought, okay, that's okay. But uh, I want to learn design also. So then you see uh, from the recommendations that you get based on your interests, based on the amount of time you're spending on the platform, we recommend, or based on the geography of uh, teachers that you are learning from. So there are special uh, you know, recommendations that come to you, okay. So you have like illustration. So maybe the next topic that you want to learn is animation. So there is science behind that. And that's how you know we keep nudging our, uh, our users to keep on learning because Again, the, it, it goes back to the first principles, thinking that we want people who are creative and curious in nature. So who someone is like that, once you start feeding them the right kind of content, you know, you uh, their, their creative juices started flowing, they get more excited, they want to learn more and more. And it, it, it becomes like a natural process rather, rather than a force where you see a lot of companies today trying to run ads and having telecallers, you know, trying to push push their product. But we don't do that. So it's 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 more about you come here for learning. You come here because you're inspired by something, and then it's our job to make you know to to keep delivering that content from those kind of creators 
that you will love and you'll continue that 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 the drive in you or the passion in you in you that got you here will not die down understand understand so in a way also i think um, as i'm listening to all three of you the other thought which is coming to my mind is the teacher was always the central point for education to really help the students and in the way in which we are looking at it right now you know like uh, dr paul mentioned you know thinking of this um, different um, uh, pedagogy styles and different ways of computational problem solving or as you mentioned mr call uh, different levels of creators or as you mentioned uh, professor pratap that you know having uh, having this kind of university uh, uh, university change itself where professors are constantly nimble and thinking of what's coming next i think the role of the teacher yeah and in fact the best thing is the regulations are also opening up in that respect and right. the new education policy is allowing for more collaborations you know between uh, traditional universities and between um, organizations which actually have ex excellent uh, real life pedagogy and curriculums so let me ask you this is a common questions and i want to ask each of you this question so this time i'll start with you mr call and then uh, professor pratap and then uh, finally dr paul so the question is imagine it's we are crystal gazing to 2030 so we are crystal gazing to 2030 and if you think of your platform uh, or your university or you know your uh, courses what do you think will be the top courses your students will be um, going through who would be your learners and what kind of jobs or work would they be doing yeah that's a good uh, good good question and uh, uh, though if if i see from from 10 years from now you know uh, any 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 course that that has you know innovation and uh, creating from zero to one uh, as a, as a core uh, would be something that people would people would uh, love to learn uh, by by that what i mean is that uh, there are there are traditional uh, courses where then there is there is there are people are learning from uh, from a long time because uh, that is what the demand is out in the in the market but with with time we are change, seeing that that it is it is what was relevant yesterday is not that relevant today and will be irrelevant tomorrow so uh, i am i i believe that in 2030 there will be very few things uh, that that might be relevant from today's uh, today's uh, you know catalog there will be like uh, uh, classes like soft skills or presentation skills that might still continue because that you know that is that is more of a personality trait rather than a uh, rather than a subject uh, but but anything that 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 involves revolves around creation creating uh, creating whether it's in terms of machines whether it's in terms of creating algorithms or softwares that is that is something like the, i don't want to pinpoint one subject but like anything that is zero to one that would be uh, very relevant uh, in in 2030 uh, how are we uh, you know prepared for that uh, obviously we keep talking to our uh, users quite often we try to understand their learning patterns uh, we try to see that what is what, what is the trend going on what are the things that they are continuously liking what are the things that they are not liking so with accumulating that user data the user preference data and engagement data we would be in a position to churn out more and more classes which are in line with what the what what the you what the learner in 2030 wants to learn great thank you uh, mr call uh, professor pratap i think same question for you for plus yeah, sure. um you know this is a great question and devlina i wish you would record this and play it 10 years later again on the same platform uh, this okay. is what all of you gentlemen said we'll hold you to it and you back yeah <laughs> yes that would be wonderful so anyway um, i i think that uh, as i said that the university system is uh, going through a huge change and it will be very different university in in 2030 uh right now our uh, clientele if you wish to call that is usually from 18 years to about 28 30 years you know phd's and postdocs that is going to change from my guess is that that is going to change from 18 to 80 that's going to be the clientele you know we are going to have uh, people enrolling in all kinds of courses at later uh, ages as well uh and and upskilling themselves getting trained in new skills continuously changing job scenarios will require that and universities have to be there to assist that that will be one there will be a lot of churn in uh in the way knowledge is created as well 
So the kind of researchers that we have today, I think we will have far more researchers from all walks of life coming in and going out. So the, the flux, I expect the flux rate through the university to be much higher, okay, uh, at all levels, okay, for researchers as well. There will be, uh, you know, faculty members who will be working here for a few years, coming up with a great idea and then running a, out as entrepreneurs and establishing a company and uh, you know running with that right so then you know new people will come in this kind of churn is going to happen so the university as we know today is going to change quite a bit and obviously the courses too you know the tectonic shift is already happening what used to be in engineering as foundational courses that has that is changing rapidly you know we have now a digital base so to speak you know, foundations are digital foundations, but there are principles of invariance also, you know, that there are some things which you cannot do away with. You know, the physical laws that hold the world together, you will still need training in those, you will still need grounding in those, and those will persist. Understand. And thank you so much, uh, Professor Pradap. And coming to you, Dr. Paul. Sure, I, I was just reminded of this famous uh, sentence by an economist who said that uh, prediction is a dangerous business, especially about the future. Right. So, <laughs> so therefore, I'm going to take go on a limb with my fellow colleagues here and take a stab at it. Um, so let me not talk about uh, you know specific subjects and topics because I think those are often have the flavor of the the quarter flavor of the year, flavor of the next few years flavor to them. So I'm going to avoid topic specific conversation, but let's talk about secular trends, right? Look at secular trends, if you bank on those, I think three clear signs. One is that computational thinking and computational problem solving in any shape or form is only going to increase. And this is going to be like, the, I mean, that's going to be language A or language B is not important, right? It is going to be this tool or that tool is not important. What's important is that more and more people coming into the, you know, their adulthood or their, uh, you know, sort of workforce are going to need computational thinking because digital disruption is sweeping every industry. So if you have to work in the workforce of the future 10 years from now, computational problem solving is inevitable. That's one clear area which I think will thrive. Second area which I should also, I believe will thrive, which connects to the point about design earlier made by Professor Pratap, is that human computer interaction therefore becomes very important because in a world where technology dominates and we live and breathe with technology on a daily basis uh, at work and at home, uh, clearly, human computer interaction and design that pertains to that. That you know, are you going to be an expert in the future on digital design? How to handle hardware, software, technology, and how do you create a human experience around it? I think that should be another area which should just go hand in hand with this kind of a growth. I think that kind of HCI user experience and design, I think, will be very big. And the third part, which I think is the the silent, uh, the elephant in the room that we all know and uh, also referred to earlier by Professor Pratap, is climate science. I mean. Climate change is going to create this complete disruption between now and the next 10 years. Entire industries will be created to solve it uh, and entire, entire workforce have to be generated to solve it. So I suppose that that is going to be an area where learning will be very important because that's really a pretty much a cold start kind of an industry. You know, we don't have a whole lot today, except perhaps electric vehicles now are becoming mainstream, but the entire knowledge around climate science and climate change, sustainability, planetary sustenance, all of that, I think will be the third big trend in terms of learning. Great. No, thank you so much, each one of you, for giving us the time. I think this is going to be very valuable for our listeners. And just to sum up, we talked about a framework for the future of technology of jobs, algorithm creators, algorithm collaborators, algorithm builders. We talked about different ways in which this could be created through a new age university system, as Professor Pratap mentioned, which could be you know, through bringing in self-leadership, bringing in design, bring in sustainability as areas to think through. Um, it could be through, you know, uh, more focus on lifelong learning and connected courses as Cole mentioned, Mr. Call mentioned. And overall and overarching, I think the idea would be that how could people keep thinking through computational problem solving as we move towards the future? And can that move, you know, as Professor Pratap mentioned, not from 18 to 30, but from 18 to 80, right? And how can we keep kind of uh, building on that? So thank you so much, each one of you for joining us today. And that's it from all of us at ET.